Thank you so much, Rana, for coming here today and taking the time to speak with us. So just to jump right into the questions, could you talk about your experience and motivations behind co-founding Affectiva and what was the core technology that Affectiva was founded on? Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here today. Um, so I am co-founder and CEO of Affectiva. Uh, which is actually an MIT Media Lab spin out. And we are on a mission to humanize technology by bringing emotional intelligence to our devices. Um, our core technology is essentially um, uses computer vision, deep learning, machine learning, and gobs and gobs of data, and a camera sensor to quantify your expressions and activities and behaviors, and then map that to an understanding of your emotional and mental state. And that powers all sorts of use cases, everything from autism research, which is what brought me over initially to MIT. Um, and then we spun out Affectiva um, to bring that technology to other industries like the automotive industry, um, media analytics, and, and a whole bunch more. Yeah, it's super amazing. And could you talk about what are some of the biggest outstanding barriers for emotional AI? Um, are they on the algorithmic hardware or data side? Yeah, you know, when, when we first started doing this research at MIT, I was part of a group called the Affective Computing Group, which is headed by Professor Rosalind Picard. And she really started this whole field of um, affective computing or, or computers that can recognize your emotions back in 1998. And there was a lot of pushback. I mean, I remember when I first did my PhD at Cambridge University before coming to MIT, people didn't really understand why I was trying to do that. Like emotions, like why do we want emotions in technology? But what people don't realize is our emotions influence every aspect of our lives, how we make decisions, how we connect and communicate with one another, um, how we learn, etc. cetera. Um, so it's so important to code that and encode that into our algorithms and our, and our you know, how we interface with technology. Um, so I would say the first or the biggest barrier initially was just people being very skeptical that this is something that we need to do. Um, I'll say, you know, over the last kind of call it five or so years, and especially in the last year with the pandemic, people suddenly realize like, oh my God, yeah, human connection is really important. And given that it's mediated by technology, we want to make sure that we can build technology that brings us together versus polarize us and, you know, tear us apart. Yeah, that's super great. So what are some areas of emotional AI that you're most excited about? There are a lot of applications of this technology. As I said, you know, when, when I first came to MIT, um, I was funded by the National Science Foundation to build the algorithms into a Google Glass looking device. This was way before Google Glass. And we deployed it with kids on the autism spectrum to help them read and understand nonverbal signals. So as it turns out, only 10% of how we communicate is in the actual choice of words we use. 90% is nonverbal. A lot of it is your facial expressions, your hand gestures, your vocal intonations. Um, and, and all of that is like really not captured by technology. And, and a lot of people, especially people on the spectrum, struggle with, with kind of recognizing these signals. Um, yeah, so we built this prosthetic device to help you know, autistic, mostly kids, and it was very successful. And then we quickly realized that there's a lot of other applications. So one, one area that I'm very interested in, and we spent a lot of time focusing on it at Affectiva is the automotive space. Can we have cars detect that you're distracted, you know, texting while driving or falling asleep at the wheel? And then the car can intervene in a way to make our, our roads safer and save lives. So that's, that's one area. The other area, which is, I think it's super exciting, but I haven't seen anybody do it at scale is mental health. We know that there are facial biomarkers of stress, anxiety, depression, um, even suicidal intent. Um, so you can imagine if we can leverage the fact that we're spending so much time on our devices to capture this data and then track it over time so that the you know, the interface can know if you're deviating from your baseline and then it can flag that to you or to a loved one or maybe a doctor or a therapist. So there's a lot of applications in that space. I haven't seen anybody do it at scale, but I'm excited to kind of see the potential there. Yeah, these are super fascinating sort of applications. 
So what are some of the biggest hurdles you see towards an even wider societal adoption in comfort with AI technology? And what do you think needs to be done for emotional recognition technology to be deployed in an ethical way? AI is really becoming mainstream, right? It's, it's um, being deployed at scale around the world. It's taking on roles that were traditionally done by humans. For example, driving your car or assisting with your healthcare. But we haven't really redesigned the social contract we have between humans and machines. And that's something we need to do to ensure that the, the, the algorithms are not biased, that they're deployed in an ethical way and, um, and, and deployed at scale in a way that does not perpetuate biases that exist in society. So I think that's the biggest issue that we have around AI today. With emotion AI, that is still true, but I would add one more thing. There are unintended consequences of any technology, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about the unintended consequences of artificial emotional intelligence, because our emotions are so key to who we are, and you don't want to use that data to manipulate people. Um, so for instance, we as a company do not do any work in the surveillance or security or lie detection space. We've veered away from that completely, even though there's a lot of money in there. Um, but we just don't feel like that's the right use case for the technology. And, and uh, you know, Affectiva doesn't entertain these industries, but I'm also very vocal about, you know, the whole kind of tech category. I think of myself as a steward for the technology and I try to evangelize like what are the right use cases and what are the use cases that are perhaps, you know, we should push back against. So I would say that's thinking through these unintended consequences ahead of time, not waiting until you've deployed it around the world and oops, you know, people use it in a way to discriminate against each other or profile people. I, I think we need to get ahead of it as technology innovators and thought leaders. Um, as a student back when I was a PhD student at Cambridge and then later a postdoc at MIT, the conversation around ethics was really decoupled from the building of the models and training the, you know, the algorithms and validating them. Um, and I think, you know, moving forward, we really need to have these conversations and have them be part and parcel of how you think about designing, developing and deploying these algorithms. So I know MIT is at the forefront of that with the new center, um, which is multidisciplinary. The idea is to bring different perspectives around the table, make sure that there are diverse point of views gender diversity, ethnic diversity, age diversity, but even diversity of backgrounds. Like you want philosophers around the table kind of poking holes at the way you're thinking about this. So um, yeah, I think we need to prioritize diversity and inclusion in how we think about AI and particularly emotion AI um, and just make, you know, take a very human centered approach to how we think about this. Yeah, these are definitely like really important topics. So what excites you about Affectiva's technology and impact going forward? So I think um, the ultimate goal with this or the ultimate vision for this technology is that someday technology will, will interact with humans just the way we interact with one another, right? Through conversation, we're already seeing that with devices like Alexa and Siri, um, but also through perception, and I just said Alexa, so it woke up. Go away, Alexa. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, through 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 conversation, through perception, through empathy, and um, the ultimate goal is to just have emotion AI and human perception AI integrated into our everyday devices, um, and we just interact with the devices the way we interact with one another. So so I would imagine, you know, I don't know. Your top, you're, you're interfacing with your microwave and the microwave does something and you kind of frown at it and says, oh, it didn't like that, did you? <laughs> um, or, or your fridge, I don't know, you approach your fridge and it knows that you're stressed and you've been binge eating and it says, nope, no more ice cream for you today. Um, lots of, yeah, so, so lots of integration into the internet of things and our everyday devices, which would power human machine interfaces, but also kind of transform human to human connection. Yeah, that would be super cool to, you know, have a fridge that'll control you from binge eating as well. Yeah. 
So you recently wrote the book Girl Decoded. So could you tell us more about what inspired you to write that and what were some joys and challenges of writing for such a wide audience? Yeah, so Girl Decoded and the subtitle is A Scientist's Quest to Reclaim Our Humanity by Bringing Emotional Intelligence to Technology. So it, um, I started writing it in 2015, 2016, so it's taken a while. It's a memoir, so it follows my journey growing up as what I call a nice Egyptian girl in Cairo, Egypt and around the Middle East. And then doing my PhD at Cambridge and then coming to MIT as a postdoc and starting the company and becoming a tech CEO in a very male dominated industry. Um, and I, so I talk about that journey and the struggles and the cultural norms that I had to kind of battle with, I guess. Um, and, and even like raising money as a female founder and a female scientist coming out of MIT and what did that look like and pitching for an emotion company to a mostly male dominated investor community, what did that look like. So I talk about all of that, but juxtaposed with the story is the story of the technology so I really try to simplify what is emotion AI and how do you build it and. Um, you know I, I take the reader behind the scenes and just really decompose it because there's a lot of. Um, myths, I guess, around AI and misunderstanding of what exactly AI is. And I try to really make it accessible to um, everybody around the world, really. I really wanted it to be a story that people around the world could resonate with. And hopefully it inspires people to forge their own paths. Yeah, that's a wonderful story. And I look forward to reading it. So could you talk a little bit more about your trajectory and how you got into machine learning? Um, so I studied computer science as an undergraduate at the American University in Cairo. And I was really, you know, I took a lot of classes as, as I'm sure you both did, but I was really drawn to the, to the human computer interface classes in particular, because I was curious about this touch point between humans and machines and what would it look like in the future. So I projected that in the future, we're all gonna have a lot of devices surrounding us and it won't necessarily be based on typing, right? Like the, the, the way we interface is gonna evolve. And of course it has, it became touch-based, voice-based. And I really think in the future, it's gonna just be like gesture-based and just very naturalistic. So I kind of projected that and I wanted to be part of, of that evolution and, and wanted to drive that evolution. So from then on, I joined Cambridge as a PhD student and I wanted to build the very first ever like emotionally intelligent machine. And um, because I'm very expressive and I care about like facial expressions and I really like watch people's faces, um, I focus on the face as the channel of communication. And this was back in the day when, um, you know, we didn't have GPUs and we didn't have sophisticated webcams. Like we had these like big blurry slow webcams. <laughs> um, so it was a lot. It, uh, this was before smartphones had any cameras, right? So it was a different universe. And I think the acceleration of technology, like the key components has really helped um, drive innovation in this space. Yeah, that's super interesting. So for those who are interested in entrepreneurship and machine learning research, what's your biggest piece of advice for transforming theoretical research ideas into a technology that can disrupt the markets? I would say if you're interested in kind of machine learning and the applications of it and entrepreneurship, first of all, it's a really awesome space because it's pretty nascent. So there's a lot of room for innovation. Second, I would say pick a problem in the world that you really care about and, and want to solve, right? And, and think of machine learning almost as a tool to get you there, right? It's not, it's not the end goal. It's just a technology that helps you, um, yeah, helps you solve problems efficiently and, and, and effectively. Um, yeah, so I would say start with something that you care deeply and you're very passionate about um, because you know, being an entrepreneur and having a startup is like being on an emotional roller coaster. Some days you'll feel like you're on top of the world, you got this. And the right, you know, the next day you hear a no from an investor or, you know, a client turns you down, like it's, it's tough. <laughs> um, so you want to have that conviction and something you really believe deeply in to drive you. 
Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And finally, do you have any advice for younger students interested in the field? Um, advice, I would say immerse yourself in networks of folks that are relevant to the space, right? So if you are interested in the application of, I don't know, AI to healthcare, right? Make sure you immerse yourself in that community, like find meetups, go to the meetups, um, reach out proactively to leaders in the space and say, hey, I noticed that you're working on blah, blah, blah. I'm also interested in blah, blah, blah. Like, can we schedule a 30 minute call and have a discussion? And that usually, you know, that opens doors, right? You get introduced to one person, they introduce you to three more people. And before you know it, you know, the key leaders in the space and stay top of mind, right? Like reach out proactively, cultivate the relationship. So when there's an opening for an internship or, a job position, they'll think of you and they'll say, oh, you know, you know, I spoke to this person and they would be a perfect fit for this position. Um, so net networking is really key. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And this is some wonderful advice. And that wraps up all of our questions. So thank you so much for coming here today. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me.